Clan share and this. Hi everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Disruption Talks. And generally, 13th of October is a very exciting day for technological developments. After all, today is Apple's event, and we will all be witness to the unveiling of the new iPhone. But today we've got something way cooler than that. We will be talking about holography, actual real holograms, just like the ones you've seen in the movies. Our guest today is Alexandra Pendraszewska, co-founder and CEO of VividQ. Um, Please, Alexandra, allow me to give an introduction to VividQ. It's basically a group of people that assembled themselves across the brightest academic institutions of the world, the likes of Cambridge, Oxford University, um, and St. Andrews, and developed, a, I quote, patented technology for commercial applications of holographic display in AR and VR headsets, smart glasses, automotive head-up displays, and consumer electronics. And you guys have raised seven million pounds to date, so I'm sure that your 30 strong team is cooking up something really interesting. But before we dive into that, I would like to dig deeper into your why. You've been the undergraduate of the year, Cambridge University, no less, recognized by the likes of Rolls-Royce, McKinsey, Forbes 30 under 30 list. How do we get from there to co-founding and C-suiting a holography company? <laughs> hi, Philip, and um, hi, everyone, and thanks so much for such a kind introduction. Um, so <clears throat> my, why, my why is very much related to um, what you already said, I think. So um, my academic journey, um, completing the um, undergraduate degree um, at Cambridge, and then discovering my passion for, for technology, which effectively made me pursue further education in the area of technology policy and management, and you know, really being immersed by this Cambridge ecosystem of innovation, R and D, uh, people basically creating and innovating something new on a daily basis. Um, and at the same time, by being part of that ecosystem, I was extremely lucky, as you said, to meet my technical co-founders, um, mostly with um, backgrounds from the University of Cambridge, the engineering and photonics departments, but also uh, some of the world's best uh, software development and, um, and mathematics departments. And this was very much the drive for me to join the team that um, was genuinely working on something that you know, was just within our imaginations for such a long time. Right. And the introduction that I've given is basically a copy and paste just verbally from your website. Can you give us a better description that I have, more layman terms, helping us segue into the topic of holography 101, which I'll question you on in a back and forth manner in a moment. <laughs> let sure. us know more about VividQ, the way it should be known. Um, sure, um, very happy to. Um, so I think that I'll actually start with technology because this is very much at the core of what we do, of our business and um, our offering. Um, so holographic display um, has been a term that, you know, we mostly came across in sci-fi movies, as you said, or, um, you know, in something extremely futuristic that we never really believed is going to become part of our reality. Um, but actually, holographic display as a concept in physics has been known since, you know, late 1960s as something that we can do with our knowledge of physics and mathematics. So the way you can think about holographic display and the way you can think about holograms is this perfect visual recreation of a physical object. So um, if you can take a mouse or whatever object you have on the table, um, the way you look at it uh, is actually by light reflecting of the surface of the object, forming a very complicated pattern that is then hitting your eye and your visual system that has developed over hundreds and thousands of years interprets this object as something three dimensional. Um, so effectively, when you think about what a holographic representation of this object is, is the calculation of that pattern that is hitting your eye. But obviously, the way you want to recreate it is on a digital display rather than, you know, by creating like a sculpture of this object. Um, so this is very much the principle of holography. Um, and when you think about this, when I tell you, you know, hologram is the perfect representation of the physical object, this is literally why holography is called hol holography. Um, the word holography comes from, from Greek holos, 
means the whole, complete. So when you think about this, a hologram is just a complete representation of the physical object, but in a digital format. Um, so I hope that this gives you kind of a better perspective of what we are working with. But um, when I tell you that effectively holographic display is just, um, you know, an exercise in maths and physics, then you'll probably also believe me when I tell you that the group of very good software developers and engineers managed to create some amazing algorithms that allow us to um, calculate those patterns, present them on a digital display so that your eyes um, interpret whatever we are showing you as a, as a physical, physical object. Um, so these are the principles of what we do. Um, and effectively, this is the technology that, you know, for a long time has been considered the holy grail of digital display. Because when you think about this, I wouldn't really want to look at your face on a flat 2D screen. Uh, you have a very pretty face, so I would be happy to see it as a three-dimensional hologram, you know, actually representing what you do, all your physical features, um, and being able to form a much deeper connection as a result. So this jump from, you know, boring two dimensional screens to actual three dimensional screens. And when I say three dimensional screens showing you images that will be hard to distinguish from reality, not like, you know, a 3D TV screens. <laughs> okay. So we've basically had a really quick uh, lesson in physics. Thank you for that. It's uh, better than anything I've had in school. So. <laughs> 10 a.m. <laughs> Um, but so we've heard what it is and what it isn't. Could you tell us? Are there any, could you, is there any line to draw between what is holography and something that isn't but could be easily mistaken with? Um, there is, and actually, that's a very good question uh, because the concept of holography and holograms in general, um, I think, has been so deeply embedded in pop culture and in general in what we really want to become reality, that the word has been a little bit abused over the past couple of decades. Um, so, you know, sometimes people ask me, so is, is the, the thing that you guys do, you know, Michael Jackson coming back on stage? Um, or is it, you know, this holographic fan that is showing logos of companies when I go to, the, to, the, to some industry show? Or, you know, is it something that I can just see on my phone in, in an AR app? Was Pokemon Go holography? Um, and unfortunately, to every single of these questions, I have to say no. But it's great that it has been so embedded in our, um, in our imagination, in our mind, because it makes it somehow easier for us to really, <clears throat> you know, um, to really explain what is coming up. And if if you realize that we are just at the beginning of this journey and you know, the, the Michael Jackson on stage, it's a simple Pepper's ghost illusion, which has been known in theater since again, like 19th century. If you think about Pokemon Go, uh, I don't really have to persuade you that the Pokemon you're seeing on your, on your screen is, is not real. Now, imagine, um, you know, having a projector embedded in your room, which would be literally projecting that Pokemon on your, on your table. Or in the meantime, wearing smart glasses that would also project a 3D hologram directly into your eyes so that the Pokemon you see on the table is really looking like, like something real. Um, so there are quite a lot of um, areas, especially with the um, rise of augmented reality, where people have been calling things holograms. Um, and even though they are not, that's OK. It means that everyone really wants it. <laughs> fair point. Fair point. I mean, the expectation and readiness of people to become not early adopters, but finally we got what we wanted is uh, definitely helpful. So. Uh, real life applications we have surrounding us day to day. Like I've mentioned before, there is, for example, head up displays in cars, more luxurious ones. We have this feature that you're behind the steering wheel and you see, for example, the speed or the GPS indications, but that's a tiny hologram and probably not many people distinguish that as a hologram. Are there any other 
places in our lives where we have holograms and we don't know about them or we are about to have holograms? Um, yeah, actually, um, automotive head-up displays is a very nice use case for us to explain to people um, because there is also a very nice step change uh, when you can introduce holography into those devices. So as you said, there are already some cars that have head-up displays embedded into their dashboards, and it allows the driver to see some additional information or more contextual information as you drive. Um, but today, um, those projections are either limited just to the windshield, so you still end up looking on your windshield, moving your eye gaze back from the road onto the windshield, which is not really ideal. There are some safety considerations. There are some usability considerations as well. You actually want to have this information as if it was on the road. So, you know, as you're getting close to the car in front of you, you really want to understand the distance between that car and yourself. Um, as you are overtaking another car, it's also crucial to understand and have this real-time adjustment of distance in terms of the information that the HUD is showing you. And this is something that holographic display, because it's a fully three-dimensional technology, is really allowing you this, um, this usability and safety in introducing this very contextual technology like holographic display is something extremely important. Um, so um, this is definitely something um, or some area where holography is making a real difference basically today. Um, but when you think about it, you know, in a, in a three to five year um, years perspective, then we are starting to talk about the actual change in consumer electronics. So as we know, as as we discussed, um, most of the most of the wearables, your smartphones, your smartwatch, um, when you're looking at the at the digital screen that is showing you information, it is obviously very high resolution. It's very impressive. The level of detail um, is there because we have kind of approach the limit of how good a two-dimensional display can be. Uh, you can't really go, you know, if you're going beyond an 8K resolution, your eye is not going to be able to resolve it anyway. Um, so then you can think, okay, what's the next step? The next step is that actually the information that you're being shown is more interactive, it's more contextual, it's more real. And this is, again, where holographic display is fulfilling all those expectations of the market, really. Okay. Uh, I was just about to ask the applications of tomorrow. I'm glad that you changed into that subject already. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking also about, say, smart glasses or mm -hmm. the likes of HoloLens, uh, two questions. Is Apple going to give us a nice customer experience, mm -hmm. consumer experience, sorry, in terms of having those glasses emit actual holograms? And HoloLens, is the name correctly implying that it's a hologram? Um, difficult questions. Um, so, no, actually, the, the question about Microsoft HoloLens um, is not that difficult. Um, no, Microsoft HoloLens is not using holographic display as of today. Um, but again, you can see that by implying that they're already creating this picture of what's going to happen. So, um, both HoloLens, but also basically all the devices that are using augmented and virtual reality or all the headsets that are trying to give you that experience, um, the majority of them actually use that decades-old 3D cinema or 3D TV technology, where they're effectively projecting um, two slightly offset images uh, to your eyes. And then because you have the glasses, your brain starts interpreting this as somehow 3D. But this illusion is very easily broken because, you know, I think most of the people who've been to IMAX, when you have this like um, first animation when the 3D starts, the logo is coming at you. And many people have this instant reaction of, you know, reaching out and trying to grab it. But basically, within a second, you realize, OK, it's, it's not there. Like my hand was so. Um, not aligned with where my brain was telling me that logo was, it cannot be real. Um, and this is basically how this illusion is being broken, you know, within the first couple of seconds of, of being in the 3D movie. It's kind of the same with the currently available headsets. You can play around with it, you can, um, you have some cool 
gaming apps or industrial applications as well, because the headsets are quite big. So you don't really want to be hanging around in it um, on the street or, or in your office. Um, but you very quickly realize that this is not an actual three-dimensional representation as you expect from the world. So okay. um, we are not there yet. So those devices are not using holographic display yet, um, but they will. Um, there are still some challenges to be to be addressed, mostly on the hardware side, um, to make sure that those devices can be, you know, as seamless as possible. You want your pair of Ray-Ban glasses, but just with additional functionality. You don't want to be wearing a computer on your face. So computational challenges that VividQ is partly solving with our software as well um, are basically getting us to the point where this is not a technology of the future today, but the technology of today. Okay. So speaking of seamless, let's uh, say Apple, when will I be able to buy glasses that will be up to Apple standards, meaning that I'm not wearing anything clunky, I'm wearing something that looks nice and isn't something that I notice, it's something that's embedded into my sort of digital extensions of my life. Um, so I think it would probably be an overstatement if I told you that I know everything that Apple is doing, uh, but I can definitely know as much as my wonderful team can learn from the patent applications or as much as I can read from, from industry reports. Um, and I would be probably willing to bet quite a lot of money that will not see a holographic display in um, Apple's glasses um, in its first version, or that they will not release uh, uh, a first version uh, if they will not be able to get the display technology right. Um, there are obviously many, many um, decisions around this. Um, some people may say that, you know, if you just want to release very expensive ray bands that just give you like additional information about you know a notification that you just got on your phone there are technologies that will probably allow you to do it but would apple go just for that and then market it very well so people think that this is useful enough i don't know but i've seen it i'm the apple person myself um so you know i've been um, I've been using a Mac, I've been using an iPhone all my life, but, um, but we all know that, that the innovation is very iterative. So we can say, you know, it's good enough to just have a simple functionality today with a technology that is not meeting all the expectations. But I'm quite confident that what the market really needs is something that is going to deliver this complete experience. So when I speak of Apple, we're definitely thinking consumer tech, but there's obviously also business applications. What comes to my obviously ignorant to the holographic world mind is consumer, mostly entertainment communications, uh, business, mostly increasing performance, streamlining operations, uh, uh, educational purposes. Am I thinking the correct way? Would that be the split between what holography is for day to day consumers and what it is for business? Um, so the way I like to think about this um, is not specifically in terms of uh, end applications, because um, for me and in general for um, for VividQ, our vision is very much to just change the entire display industry. And when you think about this, you know, what are you using your smartphone for today? You're using it for all the things you have just mentioned. So if we have upgraded your display to have more functionalities to be to be more immersive then it would have an impact on every single area that you're currently using your smartphone for um, that's why you know we never really chase the vr market as as a sector for us to focus or the application to focus because while there are definitely you know applications in gaming there are definitely applications in the industry I just don't believe this is a big enough market to really make a difference. Like how many, how many of us, even within VividQ, have a VR headset? And looking at that stat, not many, it's basically telling you that it's either the technology that is not there yet or the application not, is not big enough. So the applications for me are basically everything you do today using a digital screen, but better. <laughs> 
So don't think about it in terms of use case A or B or C. Think about it as a platform shift, basically, for everything that I'll be using. I like to say a new underlying technology for displaying digital data in general. Um, again, end applications are important because it can't be just a gimmick. It can't be just something that, you know, a consumer electronics manufacturer goes because they want it to be just a little bit more fun because it will, it will not make this technology universal. Um, we know what happens with foldable phones, right? <laughs> so uh, if yeah. you want to introduce a technology that is really creating uh, a big change across the whole industry, you need to have very strong use cases. And you know, when talking about automotive hats, when talking about um, changing communications, when talking about changing the way that we are, you know, looking at design or or any kind of visual planning and graphics um, in the digital world, all these things will be so heavily impacted if we changed the underlying technology that we're using to display them. Um, because yeah, we are used to a three-dimensional world. We prefer to meet someone in person still um, because the experience, all the cues that you are getting from a three-dimensional display is just so much different than what you're getting from, from, from a panel display that is basically a norm today. Okay, and uh, you uh, you just mentioned uh, foldable phones in a very savage comment. I appreciate that. Do you think we will be skipping that part, that holography is just right around the corner and foldable displays will be something that we will say, cool, but you didn't make it on time because now we've got holography? Um, so to be perfectly honest, while I do see like some applications of foldable phones, um, I think that, um, you know, this is, this is more of a change in the form factor rather than the actual technological choice, a change, right? So when we think about moving from, um, a 2D panel display to something that is, you know, reflecting a three dimensional image that you can that you can interpret as something extremely real. Uh, this is, I think, a fundamental fundamental change. When you talk about um, getting your 2D panel display and allowing you to like fold it into your pocket, is probably more of just just the form factor change. Which I'm not saying is you know doesn't make sense because it, it probably does in in very many circumstances, but um, it's just not really changing kind of the fundamental way that this display works. Um, so I would like to I would like to think that um, that the shift from from 2D displays to, to holographic displays will be um, will be much more um, significant um, to the industry. And you use this keyword, uh, new technologies. And with new technologies, we get new problems. Are there any concerns, privacy or otherwise, that will come to burden us along with the introduction of holography? Um, I think it's definitely something that we always have to think about. And increasingly, um, you know, within the entire tech ecosystem, uh, this is a very, a very big question right now because it's just not... It's not just that you're creating, you know, a new tool or that you're creating just um, a new platform and you can't take any responsibility for for what it's going to end up being. Like some someone who um, who, who just watched, you know, the, the new documentary on Netflix about the <clears throat> impact on social media could say that the impact is so bad that we should have a new Nobel Prize, but funded by by Facebook, right? Because the impact of the innovation is just is just so dramatic and unexpected. Um, I actually um, I actually wrote my master's thesis on unintended consequences of of AI in consumer tech. So um, you know, realizing what these are quite early on, even before I started working on those technologies. I feel was very important for me. Um, but to get directly to your question, um, I think because we are still in a nascent stage of getting those tools to consumers' hands, 
Um, I think that the best we can do today is think, you know, where can it go in the end? And if I tell you that holographic display is a technology that will allow us to, you know, have simple projectors embedded in the rooms or in the city infrastructure, so you don't have to actually have your phone on you, you can just call up your, your Facebook, your Google Maps, whatever you want, in a personalized way as you're walking down the street. This sounds amazing. Like it's giving you a completely new way of, you know, interacting with people, of, um, of being efficient on a daily basis. But at the same time, when you think about, you know, the lack of policy around advertising or the lack of policy around, um, around fake news or like how information is being spread, that's obviously raising questions that, um, that we worry about um, when developing this technology, but um, also hope that, you know, we'll eventually get slightly better at keeping up with with the policies and also self-regulating to an extent, because I think if we accept the responsibility for the tools that we build, we'll eventually also find a way to, to self-regulate how those technologies are being used. I, I like the answer and uh, I really hope this will not be the subject of another Black Mirror episode. Uh, so, just before I let you go, those last two questions to continue building your holographic empire, coming back to VivekQ. Uh, the specifics truly are under the veil of secrecy, but recently you've announced a partnership with ARM. Um, and can you share what industries you mostly cater to? Because if I understand correctly, it's a partnership between ARM and you, and basically you both in, in a side-by-side -side are catered to specific clients and i know you cannot reveal the clients but maybe the industries could somehow indicate it for us yeah uh, i think to really understand the um the importance of this collaboration um i think it's important to appreciate that as i said holographic display has been a known area for quite a long time but one of the most important um blockers for this technology to make it into commercial applications was um, how much computing power it required to actually calculate every single frame of a holographic image. Um, and if I tell you that, you know, over the past uh, decade, we basically went from calculating a single hologram on a supercomputer, then calculating it on, you know, a, a stack of multiple uh, processors, GPUs. And now with VividQ's algorithms and with, um, with ARM's knowledge in how to build mobile processors, we can calculate real-time holographic videos on a mobile phone. This is, this is the journey that we've, been, that we've been basically on for the past three years at VividQ. So the collaboration is very much to truly enable holographic display in consumer electronics. Um, Starting with AR wearables, augmented reality, smart glasses is very much a big theme at the moment. Um, and if you can use the computing power of your phone to support, you know, the best display experience that you can have on your smart glasses, then this is basically what this collaboration with ARM um, is, uh, is allowing. Um, you know, we want to go further afterwards. We want to, um, we want to build our proprietary uh, chips. So you can actually have a holographic display embedded into any device you want without the need of carrying your, your mobile phone, as we were discussing before. But right now, we are making a massive step change, really allowing holographic display to become part of those, of those commercial uh, devices. And if you think about our, um, our customers, think about any consumer electronics company in the world that has that has an ambition to really, you know, lead the market and continue to be at the top. Speaking of leading the market and being at the top, you're in the process of securing one of Europe's largest Series A rounds, and you plan to scale your team a couple times. Can you share what's next for VividQ 2021 and onwards? Um, so right now um, we are 30 people strong team. Um, we have our um, technical offices and a lab um, in Cambridge, UK. 
Um, and we are supporting a number of projects, as I said, that are allowing holography to become part of our life. Um, following our, our Series A round, um, we are planning to scale the team. And there is never enough talent um, that, um, that we can really accept on board. Um, we have people who are creating, you know, innovations that would be worth a PhD um, that are patentable effectively on a daily basis. Um, and we want to be able to have more of them on board. Um, we don't really sell in Europe. Um, all the exciting R&D is really happening uh, in, the, uh, in the East, uh, Japan, Singapore, but also United States. Uh, we want to grow our presence there as well um, to basically make sure that you know, we can we can deliver the, the consumer devices um, that are using our technology as soon as possible. Okay, so thanks all for that. And just before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, is it a possibility that once we finish this live and people search for VividQ at LinkedIn, when they go on your page, will they be able to see some demo? of the holographic uh, experience, so to say. I know I've seen some videos that you shared with me, but the question is, is there anything that anybody who was listening to us for the past half hour can simply go and see for themselves? What is it that we're talking about in real life? Um, so right now, uh, because we are in the middle of the funding round, uh, we actually have not shared our most recent work publicly yet, um, but we will be publishing another uh, blog with ARM as part of our partnership, where we are giving a little sneak peek into what's the latest and greatest from VividQ. So I would definitely uh, encourage everyone to follow our, our LinkedIn page. Um, and in the next couple of days, um, I encourage you as well to learn more about holography and uh, see our latest demos as part of the ARMS blog. All right, so just like Alexandra said, be on the lookout and make sure to follow the LinkedIn profile of VividQ. Uh, and in the meantime, Alexandra, thank you so much for your time. And I know that you have to go into other calls, so I won't be keeping you any longer. Any last words or remarks? Um, we have um, one uh, very nice saying um, in VividQ that uh, I usually like to quote at the end of um, at the end of our talks or meetings. Um, when you think about, you know, why do we really need a 3D, like real 3D display, why do we need holography? It's predominantly because the world isn't flat. <laughs> we are looking at a 3D world using two dimensional displays. So we are very much on, on a mission to change that. <laughs> OK, so thanks a lot for your time. And you'll be able to share this and view this uh, video uh, after it's published by LinkedIn. So Alexandra, thank you so much for your time and uh, see you soon. Thank you, Philip. See you soon. Bye-bye.